it's, it's actually very interesting uh, doing this, this presentation because this presentation wasn't really the key focus of our study. It was more an afterthought. Um, and the afterthought um, also led to one of the problems that this study has got because we included the question that we use quite late in our study, but I will actually come back to that as well. Um, so we, we were actually interested in, in finding out if an active labor market policy um, could actually, uh, how an active market labor policy could affect actually happiness. So this doesn't necessarily follow on, on the first two presentations. It's, it's not on, on subjective well-being in terms of poverty. It's really a sort of life satisfaction. Okay. Um, and very much like my, my first speaker, uh, why do we care about happiness in the first place? Um, again, we, we sort of uh, very much from the labor economic side and, and we also diving into um, this, this area only recently. So this, this is the first time that we're actually presenting these findings and, and uh, comments are most welcome. Um, but what, what mattered to, for us in, in that sense, actually? I mean, like, there is uh, definitely an established correlation between uh, employment and self-reported happiness, okay? And that has been actually shown over and over again. Um, especially sort of we know that, that people that are employed report to be much more happy than the people that are actually unemployed. Secondly, um, could self-reported happiness be somehow used as a policy indicator, okay, and on two, in two ways actually, uh, as a measure of success of a policy, but most probably also as an indicator of who to target in the policy. In South Africa, for example, there is a, a long, long lasting debate about the correct definition of unemployment. Um, in particular, should the discouraged workers be included in the unemployment rate or not? Um, and um, it started with a paper with King in the Night. Um, it's recently sort of updated by a paper by Lloyd and uh, Labrand as well. And I think the idea is that they show that actually happiness can be used to make a strong argument that people that stop searching are not necessarily happy. They're actually they're very unhappy about their, their state of life. Okay, so um, again, so more on the policy side. But <clears throat> what also, what was interesting for us in particular was more the literature that started to develop around um, the effect that actually the mood will have on economic behavior. And I'm talking about a paper by Ifcha and, okay, I, I struggle to say the name, Zorgami. If I said it incorrectly, I apologize. <laughs> and uh, the, the basic message was that um, happiness actually can reduce the uh, live for the day behavior. So people actually, if they're happier, will be a little bit more forward looking rather than just sort of live into the day um, and actually sort of most probably engage in economic activity or behavior that will have long-term benefits, okay? So how do we link all this to an active labor market policy? Um, one paper that, that uh, we looked at was written by Benjamin Krost, who used a German active labor market policy. It was a subsidized employment project. And he wanted to find out if the subsidized employment project actually affected happiness of the uh, exposed participants, okay, so of the participant of the project. Um, he, uh, he used two methods, he uh, used propensity score matching and actually showed that people that are in that subsidized program were significantly happier than people that were, remained unemployed. Um, and secondly, he showed that when this program came to an end and the employment probability for the people that were in the program uh, dramatically dropped, okay, because they were not necessarily re-employed straight away, um, irrespective of the fact that they remained or that they had access to income due to the uh, unemployment insurance, their level of happiness decreased significantly. Okay, so based on that, um, we actually wanted to, to see uh, how does that actually relate to South Africa. Uh, to stay in the theme of the uh, uh, conference, so who are the most excluded uh, a group in the South African labor market? And um, we looked at the youth unemployment problem in South Africa. Uh, in particular, we are very concerned about 
the unemployment rates of African youth. Okay? These are broad unemployment rates, so obviously I buy into the argument that uh, broad unemployment is a much better measure of unemployment in South Africa. Um, and we can see that over the period from 2008 to 2012, African youth, the age between 20 and 24, experienced unemployment rates, broad unemployment, excess of 60%, okay? up to 66% actually. Um, uh, colored youth is not necessarily much better off, but still um, um, uh, significantly better off than the African youth. So African youth really struggles to get into the labor market. And we also know that the 20s is a very crucial time period for people to actually finish education and uh, transition into labor markets. Okay. So based on that, um, um, the, the Harvard group, the so-called Harvard group, uh, one, of, uh, one of the experts on it, Jim Levinson, actually wrote a paper where he suggested that South Africa should experiment with a youth wage uh, subsidy or hiring voucher in order to make it cheaper for firms to experiment with uh, young job seekers whose productivity levels are under. Okay. Um, the, our research unit, the African Microeconomic Research Unit, and sorry, I should have... I apologize for that. All the authors on this paper are part of this research unit. So <laughs> it's a very uh, concerted, collaborated of effort. Um, our research unit was commissioned by the National Treasury to actually uh, test the logistics and also the mechanisms of a, a hiring voucher uh, for South Africa, for that youth group. So uh, the, the project itself actually um, looked at 20, 24 year olds, um, they basically got a voucher for 5,000 rand, which lasts at least six months, uh, which could, would, can pay up to half the wage with a maximum of 833 rand, and the company basically had to climb back. So a person would go with the voucher to a company and say, if you hire me, um, this institution will reimburse you for part of the wage that you will pay for me. Okay. Um, where, does the, where was the study implemented? Um, sorry, so first of all, uh, we initially started um, in 2009 and interviewed around 4,000 young people. We had a second baseline in 2010, and also the allocation of vouchers uh, was, was done in 2010, um, with a follow-up in 2011 and in 2012. Um, the areas that were covered were Gauteng, Durban, and Polokwane, so two more urban areas and one rural area, um, sorry, um, as well as two sampling uh, strategies. Uh, one was to actually include labor centers, so we actually got respondents from labor centers. Uh, the other one were actually uh, uh, enumerator areas. So what was the effect itself of the wage uh, subsidy? Um, it had a relatively large and robust treatment effect with sort of an upper limit of seven, seven percentage points on the employment probability of the treatment group. Okay. So um, the treatment group definitely experienced quite a large uh, em employment effect and that holds for, for various uh, specifications as well. So the question now clearly is what has happened to the happiness? The question that we use, and as I said, I mean, it, it was more of an afterthought. Um, one of our enumerate, not enumerated, but one of our uh, survey managers decided that would be a nice question to investigate one day. So they basically just snug it, snug it in. Um, so in 2011, okay, 2011, we don't have a baseline. That's, that's the reason why I'm sort of pointing this out. Uh, in 2011, we asked our respondents to indicate how they actually feel about their life in general, early up in the, in the survey so that it's not influenced by other questions. Um, it's a, it follows a typical uh, Likert scale uh, with very unhappy to very happy five different outcomes. Uh, we transform this into, uh, we, we follow sort of the literature and transform it so we turn very unhappy into one and then all the way up to five for very happy. Okay. So what is our prior? Given the, tr the treatment effect on employment and given the literature that actually suggests that employment should actually be correlated with higher levels of happiness, we should see that on average the treated group should report 
more uh, high, higher levels of happiness. So the red ones is the treated group and the blue one is the control group. Okay. Well, first of all, what we find um, is, well, this one sticks out. <laughs> okay. um, the treated report to be more unhappy in the unhappy classified group, um, the, uh, the control more indifferent or sort of happy, whereas then we've got again a small fraction of treated that report to be very happy. Well, I looked at it and looked at it over and over again. I don't find a pattern there. Okay. Other than there isn't a pattern, which is surprising. Okay. Which is surprising. Um, so obviously, you know, um, there is this relatively stronger effect on being unhappy, but we also have got this effect that they are more happy on this side. Um, so how much do we actually pick up when we run this as a regression? Um, we're starting off with a straightforward OLS with and without controls, um, and then order probe it, and I will come just now to the propensity score match as well. What we find is we have a negative effect. So again, that in itself is actually very surprising, right? Um, because, as I said, we've got this large employment effect, but it's incredibly marginal. Like it's, it's actually not significant at all. And that is sort of quite, quite uh, that's the story that we get across our uh, different specifications with or without controls. So what is the story with propensity score matching? Because we don't have a baseline, Okay. It could be that we simply had a larger number of very unhappy people in the treated group okay, who, after they now got treated and experienced more uh, employment, might also now come to the same level of happiness as the control group. Okay. Um, so we don't know. So what we did with our prevention score matching is we, we matched on characteristics in 2010 so we mentioned the group in 2011 on characteristics in 2010 that are highly correlated with uh, life satisfaction. So, for example, including um, uh, education. Well, a lot of the ones that were mentioned here we haven't thought about yet, but now that I was here, now we can include them. But we've got self-reported health, uh, number of children, being a parent, being uh, uh, the marital status, uh, individual characteristics, employment status as well. So things that we could think of would affect life satisfaction. So even if we control for that and we used a number of different uh, algorithms to actually test for the sensitivity of the, um, the, the result doesn't change much. Okay, <clears throat> so but, but why could that be? Why could it be that on average we don't pick anything up? Well, maybe the story is actually that the people that actually did get employed through the treatment effect have a very positive effect. Okay. Whereas the people that didn't get employed, despite being treated, so despite having a voucher and they still can't find a job, maybe they got incredibly dissatisfied with life. Okay. So maybe what we just have here is the average effect of those two groups, of these two effects, okay, where treatment actually just had uh, op op opposing effects to that. So we split the sample, and uh, I know that this is not, that's not the correct way to do it. And again, we'll talk about this just now. So we split the sample and just wanted to see, okay, are the people that are actually unemployed in 2011, uh, treatment and control group, are they significantly different? So is it really driven by these two very opposing uh, impacts uh, across the, the employment uh, status. Yes, we do pick up actually this strong, not strong, but like again this, this stronger uh, effect of the unemployed in the unhappy group and we sort of get rid of the very happy ones. But again, it's not extreme, it's not a very strong effect, right? So um, we again try to see if it holds when we actually run it uh, through various regressions. Um, we have the negative coefficient, as we would predict. Okay. Um, we again do PSM, and that, that's, that's the reason why I was saying this is clearly not the best way to do it. Uh, because the two groups clearly aren't the same anymore. They cannot be the same. Okay. The unemployed in the treatment group are very different now to the unemployed in the control group. 
for the mere fact that anyone who was treated and successfully transitioned into employment would have been potentially in the unemployed group still. Okay, so there, the comparison itself is problematic, and we are fully aware of that, but it was more for us to actually see and unpack if there is uh, something in there. So on the employed side, do we then sort of see a stronger effect on the employed side? Um, again, we've got a positive effect, but it's not significant. We do the same thing with propensity score. So nothing there, okay? or very, very little is there. So then we actually thought, okay, maybe, maybe it's sort of uh, um, heterogeneities, um, and we should look at the initial state or their state in 2010 and sort of interact that with, uh, with the treatment. This is, not yet, this is not the treatment itself, but this just shows people that were previously employed, um, the red ones previously employed. Um, so this group is just previously in 2010, and where do they actually move in 2011? People that are unemployed in 2011 compared to people that are employed to 2011, despite the fact that, the, that both groups were actually employed in 2010, okay, people that are employed report higher levels of uh, satisfaction. Okay. Um, again, we can't put good relationship, but it definitely shows that employment okay, is again correlated with higher levels of, of satisfaction. Causally, we can't say. The same holds for the people that were initially unemployed. Okay? Unemployed in 2010, unemployed in 2010. The blue line are the ones that are employed in 2011, whereas the red ones are the ones that are unemployed in 2011. Again, the unemployed report lower levels of satisfaction. We don't know if they were more uh, dissatisfied or unhappy already in 2010. It's, it's impossible for us to unpack it. Okay. So, but what we do is, just to sort of get, get somewhere with it as well, so we, we interact uh, the treatment with their previous employment status. So the employment status in 2010, and we actually want to see, okay, um, can we pick up any changes or differences in their reported happiness uh, on that level? Our comparison group um, are treated previously unemployed in 2010. Okay, and we compare them against treatment that are previously employed, as well as control previously employed and control previously unemployed. This is the interesting part. This, these are the controlled previously unemployed, um, and again, we don't find any difference in their reported uh, uh, happiness. Okay. But the uh, previously employed, irrespective of who's treated or control, report much larger, much higher levels of uh, life or happiness actually in 2010. Well, one reason for that is we know that employment in 2010 is highly correlated with employment in 2011. Okay? So for us to unpack that, it's actually very, very difficult. Okay. What are some of the problems that we've got? And, and just to come back to that. So the biggest problem clearly is um, the baseline. The baseline story. Uh, because we don't know if we are balanced uh, uh, in terms of happiness in 2010, it's very difficult for us to actually make uh, a lot of the claims. However, we do find that, I don't know why it's, it's switched off. We do find that there are actually uh, balance on most other characteristics. Actually, for 2010 and 2011, the samples, the control, and the treatment are really well balanced uh, um, over the observed characteristics uh, of interest. Okay. Um, Non-random attrition. Um, so obviously, what could also happen is that um, with, with the treatment, um, because we would expect normally a much larger positive effect. So with the treatment, it could be that people that actually were successful Okay, and now on the job mark, they don't have a need to engage with us anymore. Okay. So potentially, actually, attrition is uh, on, on employment status, okay, but from 2010 to 2011. So the ones that were treated but were unsuccessful hope that we can still help them and therefore remain with us. Okay. So maybe it is actually a non-random attrition story. Um, we started, so what we find actually just in terms of, of uh, correlates with attrition, 
Um, we've got less of a problem with that for 2011 than for 2012. So that's why I'm also not using 2012 right at this point in time for, for this. Um, but on unobserved characteristics, it's difficult to say, right? So we could work with Lee bounds to actually just see how sensitive our results are actually to, these, uh, to this non-random attrition. And finally, uh, as a limitation, we, we need to look at a mediator analysis. Okay, so following along the lines of Imai et al., um, we need to actually think about the causal mechanism through which actually the three variables of interest are, are interlinked. Okay. So treatment, but treatment is supposed to affect employment where employment affects happiness. Okay. It could equally be that treatment affected happiness because they did not get employed, which affects how people behave and that actually it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They, for example, search less and therefore are more likely to stay unemployed. So in which way, I mean, like how, which one is now the mediator and which one is now our outcome variable of interest? But um, we are still playing around with that. So the conclusions. Um, so we clearly show that, again, the employed are more likely to report higher or are reporting higher levels of happiness compared to the unemployed, but across both groups, treatment and, and uh, control groups. The causality there, or the, the direction, is, is for us not really uh, able to, we can't really pick this up. What does it mean, what, what do we show for the treatment? We definitely, so there's, the findings suggest a positive treatment effect on happiness, okay, um, but it's only marginal. What we also clearly have is the positive effect for, is for employed, but there seems to be also a negative effect for people that actually remain unemployed. So the net effect for us is, is basically indistinguishable. Right? Why is it so surprising though? It is surprising because of the time period that you're looking at. The intervention was implemented as the financial crisis hit South Africa. The largest group that suffered from the financial crisis okay, were African youth. So, we would have expected that a policy that actually gives access to employment, which happened, should actually have led to a much larger level of happiness. Okay. We don't see that. So <clears throat> what could that mean, actually? One possible explanation is that for this particular age group, okay, employment is not as high a determinant of happiness as potentially for other age groups. Maybe it is an experimental phase, though. 20 to 25, okay. If I have a job, yes or no. I mean, I would like a job, but maybe it's not as, as important in order to, to determine my happiness. I would like to leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>